Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Rubin. I write for the Washington Post. I'm a contributor to MSNBC. And we have a real treat this morning. We have three of the Republican presidential primary candidates. Um, so let's bring them onto the stage. Um, this is sort of like a pageant style here. Uh, Bill Weld, former governor of Massachusetts. I saw him for that afternoon on that too. We have Mark Sanford, former governor of South Carolina, Carolina. and Joe Waltz, who came for radio and many other things in the house and all kinds of stuff. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. So let's start with the news. Bill, has the president committed impeachable acts? The president has committed uh, hugely important and very obvious impeachable acts. Number one is the uh, 10 examples of obstruction of justice that are lovingly detailed in volume two of Bob Mueller's report. Number two is the, uh, is the really uh, leaning on the president of a, another nation to interfere in our most sensitive uh, domestic affairs, namely a presidential election, and one at that in which the president has a stake uh, in return for personal gain. And if there were two things that the framers of the Constitution were worried about, it was number one, foreign interference, and number two, corruption of office, by which I mean use of an office for personal gain. Those are the two biggest no-nos in the entire Constitution. And the president is not only impeachable, he is removable. Joe, you served for a bit. Um, what is and is not the Republican Party capable of doing this? Again, Jennifer, to go back to your first question, I mean, think about this. If soliciting dirt on a political rival from a foreign government, if that's not impeachable, then nothing is. If colluding with a foreign government to sabotage our elections, and that's what Donald Trump did, then nothing's impeachable. I agree with Bill as well, though. You read the Mueller report, I mean, it's clear there he ought to be impeached. Um, go through the process, and I believe you gotta go through the process, but he does need to be impeached. If Donald Trump's not impeached, then, then nobody should be impeached. Mark, I know you have concerns that doesn't at this point look like the Senate is gonna remove. Uh, would you still be in favor of the House impeaching? If not, what's the solution? Yeah, my concern is this, not on the merits of, of, of what Bill and Joe are getting at, but on the question of the politics of what you do about it. And my concern is this, if, if you move forward with impeachment, uh, the House, I, I think, would quickly come to a conclusion and, and say there's wrongdoing here. But on the Senate, you don't have the 20 Republican votes. And so what you don't want is to earn the impeachment merit badge, but then lose the larger battle and him stay in office. What I want, and I think what all three of us want, and what I think a lot of Americans want, is him out of office. And I think that something like a censure more greatly guarantees that probability because at that point you'd have a clear message from the House and Senate. You wouldn't have a conflicting report coming out of the Senate that would allow the president to say, see, I told you I did nothing wrong. The Senate didn't, didn't uh, come up with a conviction here. I did nothing wrong. And so I just think we need to be careful about, and this is the reason I think Pelosi was initially reticent, about stepping into something that ultimately plays to Trump's favor. And I think a personality contest between himself and Jerry Nadler may well play well for Jerry on, in California or New York, but I don't think it plays well in the heart of I, I see Joe well, no, shaking Jennifer, his head violently. Well, no, again, with all due respect to my friend Mark, I don't give a damn about how, uh, how impeachment plays politically. You do what's right. This man has abused the powers of his office. Jennifer, if, if, if he had that conversation with the president of Ukraine two years ago, he should have been impeached. I don't give a damn if he had that conversation with the president of Ukraine two months before an election. He's abused his position. I don't care how the politics sort out. You have to do what's right. I would, I would humbly say this, though. Sure. In doing what's right, what you want is the outcome of him out of office. And I keep looking at what more greatly guarantees that probability. Because you think about the last two impeachments, both of them occurred at, at the beginning of a second term. This one's quite different. This is at the end of a first term where you have a voter referendum in a matter of months, 
and to, for the, the Congress to say clearly, we disapprove what he did is obviously wrong, but we trust the American public to get it right. In a matter of months, you guys make the conviction, you decide, I think they would convict. Bill, you look pain. Well, Jennifer, I think the only way the, the country is gonna be able to breathe easy again in the foreseeable future is if the president is removed by the Senate. If he is removed, he can never hold an office of profit or honor under the laws of the United States again, and he would be removed by a perfectly constitutional and legal process. I'm sure some on the other side would argue, oh, that would be a bad precedent. We'd only, we'd become a banana republic. I think just the opposite. I think it would be a valuable precedent in case some, uh, precedent, in case some future would-be dictator started acting up again. We could say, no, no, there are guardrails here. There are limits on the untrammeled exercise, usurpation of authority by the head of the executive branch. Look back at the Trump case. And I think, among other things, unless that happens, uh, and the president makes uh, successfully makes all the Republicans in the Senate walk the plank for him, that's the end of the Republican Senate, and I think it would very likely be the end of the Republican Party. Hey, Jennifer, one final point. And, and again, I, I believe Donald Trump is a traitor, and I, I'm speaking broadly. He broadly, he betrays this country every single day. And that's what he did when he told the president of Ukraine, dig up dirt on Joe Biden. He betrayed our elections. If you don't impeach him for that, you're telling future presidents that that's okay to allow foreign governments to screw around with our elections. We can't set that precedent. All right, I'm gonna oh, wait, take, last point. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the moderator's okay. comments so you can work it back in. This brings us around to a question that puzzles both Democrats and ex-Republicans like myself, which is, what the heck is the matter with Republicans? Why do so many people in the House and Senate who clearly know better, why are they continuing to rally around Trump? Mark? Uh, the name of the game is staying in the game for a lot of folks in politics, and it's an exercise in self-preservation. Um, they, they saw what happened to me. I sort of ran my mouth a bit against the president when I was in Congress, and there was a consequence to doing that in an electoral sense, and they don't want that to happen to them. So I, I don't think it's anything more advanced than a question of self-preservation. Yeah, hold on, Jennifer. I want to see if I can find Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz. I'll bet, Jennifer, I'll bet they're hiding under this stage right now. All of these congressional Republicans who despise Donald Trump and understand the threat he is like Mark, Bill, and I do, they're hiding under a stage for another year. They want Trump to lose. And then they think when Trump loses, Jennifer, the Republican Party can just go back to what it was. It's too bad. They've sold their soul to this president. All right. Well, let's move on since these three gentlemen are running for president. We had an announcement this week that our annual deficit is almost a trillion dollars. I seem to remember Donald Trump campaigning on the notion that he was gonna wipe out the deficit. So, Bill, what's happened to fiscal responsibility and how do we start getting a hold of this? Well, Donald Trump is a Republican in name only. He's not an economic conservative by any stretch. <laughs> uh, I'm running for president because there's some things I'd like to do in Washington, D.C. Uh, thing number one, and Mark is really the deficit expert, uh, but I did close a 16% deficit in one month when I came in as governor in Massachusetts and uh, was rated the most fiscally conservative governor in the country. So we have to stop uh, the, uh, the deficits entirely can't wait for that, and if you have the political will, it's easy enough to do. Uh, I'd like to go on to uh, climate change and reversing the order of things in the international area, but I'll, I'll wait for further questions on that. Jim? Yeah. And I want a, a, a hat tip to Mark Sanford, because he is probably the most outspoken deficit hawk in this country. Look, here's the truth about Trump, Jennifer. Trump's never given a damn about the deficit or debt. He's been the king of debt his whole entire life. The problem is the Republican Party. I went to Congress eight years ago because of this issue. Mark Sanford's been talking about this issue probably since you were nine years old. Bill Weld as well. The Republican Party doesn't care about the debt. $984 trillion deficit announced 
yesterday. If Barack Obama were president, when Barack Obama was president, Jennifer, we Republicans would raise hell. But because it's Donald Trump, congressional Republicans don't say anything. Sad commentary. Um, Bill, you mentioned climate change. This is another mystery to many people who have had an elementary school education, which is why do the Republicans continue to deny something that is as, I think, scientifically provable as is the connection between cigarette smoking and cancer? Wouldn't they be better off acknowledging the, pro the problem and then advancing what they think would be conservative solutions? Well, Mr. Trump denies climate change. He has a one-word platform hoax. Uh, and I, I think the reason is uh, Mr. Trump has no substantive knowledge base on any substantive issue, any <laughs> substantive issue. And dealing with climate change is not difficult. You put a price on carbon, whether it's a congressional statute or an emergency action by the president, say so many dollars a ton if you want to put carbon into the atmosphere, 40, 50 dollars a ton. Uh, and then the market responds to the pricing signal and the emitters, the oil and gas companies, the uh, coal companies, if they're still around, uh, who buy natural gas, they pay that price. And if that, as that price goes up, they say, ouch, that hurts. I'm not going to put so much carbon into the atmosphere. That will get us to the point where the uh, temperature of the atmosphere will not rise more than 1.5 degrees centigrade between now and 2050, which is the only thing we have to do. And I can't resist pointing out that all the Democratic plans, as far as I can tell, are boasting not about how they're going to limit the amount of carbon going in the atmosphere, but how much money they're going to spend. Bernie Sanders is $16.3 trillion. Uh, poor Joe Biden, and I use that phrase ironically, is bringing up the rear with only $1.6 trillion. And uh, in, in education, is everything going to be free or only most things going to be free? It's, it's they're, they're dealing with inputs not I'm, outcomes, I, and that's how you get in trouble in the budget area as well. You take last year's appropriation, that's the input, you add 20% and presto, there's your budget. So th this is a habit of mind we have to get away from. I must say, I am continually surprised that Democrats who don't really have a problem raising taxes, not one of them, I think this is correct, has suggested a carbon tax, which seems to be the most direct means of dealing with this. Mark, you live in South Carolina, which is a coastal state. They call it low country for a reason. Is the public ahead of politicians on this issue? Do they understand it? Would there be a response from a conservative state like South Carolina if Republicans actually showed some leadership on this? Yeah, in fact, in the first congressional district race, it was actually the environment that was the pivotal issue in in, in, in in turning that district from a district that had been Republican for the last 50 years to a Democratic district. And it was the issue of offshore drilling and the larger basket of environmental issues. And I've just found it perplexing, to Bill's point, I mean, I say to Republican friends, well, let, let me get this right. You trust science to do amazing things with your body, uh, with pharmaceuticals or a trip to the emergency room, but you don't trust science outside your body. I mean, it's just a, a, an absolute non sequitur. And so I do think that the public is ahead of where elected folks are. And I think this is another example of, in essence, Trump's hijacking of the party because he does have the big bully, the pulpit, and he does have the big microphone. And so House and Senate members are at times too reticent to challenge that. If he's already staked out a position, whether it's on spending or whether it's on climate, they don't want to buck up against him. No, I, Jennifer, I was just, just to buttress what these two guys said, look, Republicans right now are losing young people by the droves. Uh, young people care about climate change, and we have somebody in the White House who calls it a hoax. And to your point, Jennifer, we need to find a solution, smart solutions, not necessarily the hysteria that the world's going to end in four years, but not the ignorance of Republicans that facts don't matter, but we need to have a seat at the table. And as long as the Republican Party says, as Trump does, it's a hoax, then we're not sitting at the table to address this serious issue. When I reached political maturity, um, Ronald Reagan was president. And one of the things that attracted me to the Republican Party in the first place was its position in the Cold War, that we were in favor of freedom, that we were 
allied with the free world, and that he felt it was unacceptable for the Soviet Union to gobble up its neighbors. That doesn't seem to be the policy of Donald Trump, and there's not a whole lot of pushback. There is some for the Republican Party. I would also point out that part of the Ukraine scandal is that he was willing to throw Ukraine to the wolves during a time where Russia occupies part of their country. He was willing to suspend military aid so he could get a little boost in the primaries. Bill, give us a sense of how he went or how Republicans went astray. And what's the right course if the Iraq war didn't work out, but on the other hand, Trump's bring them home from Syria creates a debacle. Where should the country be on foreign policy? Well, the country has to return to a policy of full engagement, a robust diplomacy uh, with, with our allies and uh, other countries around the world, something in which President Trump has no interest uh, because he's a complete isolationist and he wants to will out of existence every other country in, in the world, it, it seems. America first, last, and, uh, and always. And uh, beyond that, to, to your point, I think uh, it's very troubling that the president was willing to sacrifice uh, Ukraine to his friend Vladimir Putin of uh, Russia by withholding $400 million in desperately needed military aid. Ukraine and Russia are engaged in a hot war right now, and I think the president's action come pretty close to giving aid and comfort uh, to uh, Russia, which is the closest thing we have to an enemy, and it's part of a pattern of the president wanting to build up Vladimir Putin. What he did with the Kurds, what he's doing in Syria, absolutely bolsters the position of two countries, Russia uh, and Iran. But the, the theme of bolstering up Russia, wanting to get them back in the G7, it's Russia, Russia, Russia. And it seems that the President of the United States agrees with a, a Vladimir Putin of Russia that the boundaries of Russia really should return to the boundaries of the old Soviet Union. That's an assault on the national security of the United States. I'm sorry. Hey, Jennifer, here's the point, though. Here's the point. It's all Trump. Everything we're talking about this morning is Trump. You talk about trade, you talk about the debt, you talk about climate change, Russia. It's all of these Republicans in the House and the Senate, they're afraid of their shadows because they don't believe this stuff, but they're keeping their mouth shut because they're afraid of Trump's voters. And all roads do lead to Putin. Let's be clear, we elected somebody who was doing business, trying to do business with Russia while he's running for president. He lied to the American people about it. That's an outrage. All roads lead to Putin. Putin's got something on him, Jennifer. And, I, and let me just, I, I'd say two things. One is we need some measure, to Joe's point, of stability coming out of the White House in the way the decisions are made. And I think what was particularly troubling for allies abroad or uh, domestic allies in the Pentagon or in the House or Senate is, is the way in which the president made what seemed to be a whimsical last minute decision with regard to what was happening in Syria. That has lasting imprint in terms of the way that allies will or won't trust us. So we, we need some measure of stability, which echoes out across a broad range of different fronts from the White House, but concurrently at the congressional level, Congress needs to step to the plate. I think Congress has been derelict in its duty with regard to the authorization of force, and so you have an 18-year running blank check uh, coming in terms of engagement in, in, in the Middle East without really the authorization of force. And body bags don't go back to the Pentagon. They go back to congressional districts across this country, and, and Congress has let itself down by not stepping up the plate and saying we're in or we're out. For many Americans, um, it used to be the case that the Republican Party was in favor of free trade. This was an easy win. We would make money selling our stuff abroad, we would keep our allies, and we would close out our foes. I was greatly chagrined when TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, fell through because this sort of checked all the boxes. And yet you now have not one party that's protectionist, but two. Bill, make the case, if you would, for free trade and maybe for resuscitating the TPP. Again, the president's uh, ignorance in foreign affairs is maddening. Uh, he opposed uh, our joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership on the ground that it would be dominated by China. 
uh, what he didn't know is that China was not to be a member of the TPP. The whole point was a beachhead in Asia of 12 Pacific-facing nations, six on our side, six on the Asian side, without China even at the table. The fact is that the United States always benefits from free trade, always is going to get the high-wage jobs because we have the most productive workforce of any country in the world by a mile, and that includes China. And, and the president's approach to foreign policy is sanctions, tariffs, no free trade, a more destructive triad of uh, aggregate national wealth of the United States is hard to imagine. I, I, can I answer that? I, mean, I, I think it's important we not tear down what the greatest generation built. And what they built at, in you know, post-World War II era was a trading system that's accrued to the American way of life mightily. So think about this, we're about 5% of the world's population, we're about 20% of the world's economy, because of the very trading system that they set up that ensured benefit to our country. And so he's trying to take us away from that and take a snapshot of, for instance, our sanctions against Cuba. At the end of the day, I think you could be well argued that those sanctions have kept the Castro regime in place because unilateral sanctions don't work, but that's precisely the route that this administration seems to be going. Hey, Jennifer, let me just, Joe, yeah, let me just ask stop. Mark a question. Um, there are a lot of agricultural states in the United States who sell a lot of stuff to China. And I think in the last year or so, I've learned more about soybeans than I ever had. Um, as Governor Steve Bullock likes to say, if they couldn't have foreign markets, every Montana resident would have to eat 40 loaves of bread a day in order to maintain that. Why aren't farmers literally out there with their pitchforks? Um, are they upset? And if not, why aren't they having their voice heard in Washington, D.C.? I think they are upset, uh, but they've been placated by the fact that $28 billion of aid went their direction to buy quiet. I think it's a temporary quiet. I think that they, they're seeing the loss of of, 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 in essence, supply chains uh, to other parts of the world, whether that's in South America or elsewhere, that I think are gonna be problematic and tough to fill over time. And I think there's a growing level of Trump fatigue, not just with farmers, but again, with suburban voters go down the list, either based on promises that were made and not kept, or promises that have been wholly discarded. And, and I think the ag thing fits into that basket. And, and Jennifer, to Mark's point, uh, Iowa farmers are upset. Uh, as, as every month goes by, and this president's promise of trade wars are easier to win evaporates, uh, I was just in Iowa just a couple days ago, they are upset. There's, there's a difference between the way they talk about Trump now and the way they did six months ago. China cheats. It's always important to remember this. Donald Trump in many ways was a course correction. The whole notion of America first, it resonated. It resonated with a lot of Americans. The problem is Trump's turned that into like America only. And he's given his middle finger to the rest of the world. To Bill's point, China cheats against everybody. What was needed was a multi-nation coalition to go after China and not put it all on the backs of our farmers. All right, so we're at a political convention, so let's talk politics. Um, Donald Trump, to my amazement, still gets over 80%. He does not get 94% of approval. That's a made-up number among the many made-up numbers um, that he carries around. But he has a very high approval rating among uh, the Republican Party. Bill, how do you take that on? What's your path to making a dent in that and hopefully catching up and passing it? My path is uh, to expand the electorate of people voting in the Republican primaries uh, all over the country, bring in more women voters, more millennials. I think millennials, they're now the largest voting uh, group, and they understand that they bear the brunt of both the deficits and a failure to do anything about climate change. So I think they're, they're getting it, and they could be the key to the kingdom there. So unlike uh, elements of the National Republican Party who seem bent on suppressing voter turnout in areas with a substantial minority uh, population. Uh, I, I, want, I want to expand voter turnout and have as many people as possible vote uh, in, in all the primary elections. I, I went so far as to take out newspaper ads in New Hampshire, pointing out that independents and Democrats can vote in the Republican primary, but they have to re-register uh, by, by a certain date. Uh, and I, I think that is going to be the salvation here when the country 
wakes up and realizes that we can't let the election and even the primary election be decided by the 50 Republican state committees because they are the Trump organizations in every state, uh, bought, paid for, and appointed by Donald J. Trump. Mark, you come from an early primary state, but strangely enough, they have canceled their primary. So we have something in common with the old Soviet Union. There is apparently only the elected leader and no democracy. Talk to us about what you think of that move and a little bit about your path to uh, victory. Just go through South Carolina. Do you begin in Iowa? Tell us how you're going to do it. Uh, it's been appealed at the, the, the the judicial level and the judge has said he's going to make a decision next week so we'll have a little bit clearer picture as to what's coming next but i would say this i think we ought to see it for what it is which is it's a sign of weakness because in the world of politics if you have the chance to pick up an 80 or a 90 percent win which is what they allege you do it all day long particularly if it's the first state in the south given its implications in other southern states the fact that they canceled that primary in south carolina says that somebody in the Trump organization is looking at numbers that they don't like, that says that their support is a mile wide, but an inch deep. I would say as to what I'm talking about, where I'm trying to resonate, is, as Joe just mentioned, I, the epicenter of sort of where I'm coming from is, we're about to go off the cliff financially. It's gonna have real ramifications in one savings account, one retirement account, one ability to get a job, and we're not even talking about it in this presidential race. I mean, the three of us are certainly attempting to do so. But on the Democratic side, it's not being talked about, and the guy who has a big microphone in the form of the president is not talking about it. We, we, we are at the precipice. The fastest growing category of government in, in the federal government that you and I own is actually interest cost. And so if you're a social progressive, it's amazing to me to think that we will spend more on interest in one year than we will on behalf of all programs on behalf of children in the United States of America at the federal level. And if you're a defense hawk, if you're from the right, You'd say, wait a minute, in just three years, we're gonna spend more on interest than we will on national defense. I mean, we, we, we are proving right what Admiral Mike Mullen said. He was the former chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff when asked, what's the biggest threat to American security? The answer is the national debt. I think we have a tipping time bomb on that front and we're attempting to talk about it. Joe? Hey, Jennifer, I wouldn't, uh, and I love being here with you, and I love being here with Bill and Mark and all of you, but I wouldn't be sitting here if Donald Trump wasn't president. The debt is a huge issue. His tariffs are horrible. Uh, what he's doing around the world, embracing these dictators, is embarrassing and will take a long time to recover from. But I'm running because Donald Trump himself, the man, is a threat. He's a threat to the rule of law. He's a threat to our Constitution. It's bigger than any issue. And to answer your question, Jennifer, I firmly believe his support among Republicans is really soft. Almost everywhere I've gone, talking to Republicans, not Democrats, they all say a variation of the same thing. Well, Joe, I like some of the things he's done, but man, I'm tired of him. And I hate that he does that, and I'm sick of the tweets, and I, I don't want to live through four more years of this. They're tired of it. Uh, and, and they want an alternative because they don't want to vote for a Democrat. Bill? You were a Republican governor of arguably one of the most liberal, how they say, progressive states in the union, and you managed to get a whole bunch of stuff done. After the election, we're gonna, whoever wins, uh, we're gonna have to all come back and figure out what to do about these major, major problems we have. How do we put the genie back in the bottle? How do we diminish this tribalistic warfare? And how do we actually get things done the way we used to in past years, where big, important legislation with support on both sides of the aisle got passed and actually made people's lives better? I would do just what I did in Massachusetts, which is to reach right across the aisle my first week in office and say to the Democratic Senate President, Speaker of the House, why don't we get together for tea and cookies once a week? We'll meet first in your office, Mr. Speaker, then in your office, Mr. President, and then we can rotate. Legislators hate to be summoned to the governor's office. So they said, okay. And that was so successful that every administration since then has done exactly the same thing. You know, the only way to reach across the aisle is to reach across the aisle. It's like cutting spending. The only way to do it is if you have the political will to do so. When I was hiring people for my cabinet, when I was appointing judges, I never asked them whether they were a Democrat or a Republican. I didn't really want to know 
particularly in the case of uh, judges, but it didn't matter. After a year or two, they became Bill Well people. They were with the program, they liked the product, uh, they saw what happened. And we, I'd like to see some grown-ups in Washington, D.C. We have a big, huge problem about to hit us in 10 years. We're gonna lose 20%. We're gonna lose 20% of all the jobs in the United States within 10 years as a result of artificial intelligence, drones, robotics, machine learning, and driverless vehicles. What to do? Well, I kind of looked into it, and uh, there are replacement jobs, but they require two semesters of post-high school education in technical areas that a uh, long-haul trucker, for example, does not now possess. But paying for that would be child's play. It would be one-third of 1% 1 of a state's budget. And all of us have been in government, and we know that to govern is to make choices. You could find that money easily and, and make it free. Yeah, I'm a Republican, and I'm saying that community college and online courses should be free to the displaced workers, problem solved. These are, almost by definition, Trump voters. Is the Trump uh, administration coming anywhere near the future of work and the future of education? No, they're not. And you know why? Because it takes too much work. But Jennifer, you talked about... You talk about trying to unify the country. This point needs to be made. Donald Trump did not divide America. America was divided before Trump. In fact, that divide, I mean, Trump's a horrible human being. Think about how the heck did this guy get elected? He got elected, Jennifer, because this country is very divided. Now, the difference is, I wanna get back to where we're divided on the issues and we've got Republicans and Democrats debating and fighting respectfully about issues. You can't do that with this man in the White House because everything is just personal, ugly politics. And that will be job one of whoever the next president is, is to try to unify this country and get back to us talking about, and yeah, arguing about just issues. I, I, I would say, um, that there are two keys. One, to Joe's point, is a question of tone coming out of the White House and the way in which at times the president looks for division rather than unification on a whole series of different issues. But the other thing is, to your point, is to, to look for ways of addressing the core problem. And I think that the core problem, whether you're Republican or Democrat, is the erosion of the American dream. The American dream has always predi been predicated really on two things. One is ever-rising levels of opportunity. My grandparents did so well, my parents did better, and I'm gonna do so better than that. And you look at the numbers, whether you go to you know, Ohio or Western Pennsylvania, if you look at the numbers across the country, people are calling that into question in ways that they never had before. And the other part that I saw in the wake of 08, back when I was governor, at the time was some conflict over stimulus money, is that people believe that the system is fair. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And so you have this truck driver, married to the convenience store clerk, and they make extraordinary sacrifices in playing by the rules so that their son or daughter might be able to go off to that community college that you were just alluding to. And, and, and again, in ways that have never been before the case, and I saw this in the wake of 08, people said, wait a minute, you know, this money center banker who took all these crazy risks, they got bailed out, but my, you know, my, my cousin down the road who was a pizza shop, they didn't get bailed out. They're hammered, the system isn't fair, which plays straight into what you're saying, which is people question the system. I think we've got to look at, at ways of addressing that American dream question that bridge both Republican and Democratic circles. And Mark, by the way, go, go Mark, ahead. let me follow up with Mark. Um, to the point about bringing people into government regardless of party, would you, if the president, consider putting Democrats in your cabinet or in prime White House positions? I did as governor. I mean, if you look at the diversity of my cabinet, I actually set records that haven't been broken since then and hadn't been preceded in terms of diversity within my cabinet. Yep. I think post-Trump, it's going to take extraordinary steps to try to unify this country. Maybe even a Republican presidential nominee and a Democrat vice presidential candidate along with that. Republican. Oh, I can't resist that one. Who would you put on your ticket? <laughs> I don't know yet, but it may, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take something like that. All right. Um, we're going to now do a brief substantive question, and then we're going to have a lightning round, and I do mean lightning round of some quick topics. But because we haven't said enough controversial things this morning, let's talk about immigration for a moment. Um, 
first of all, has Donald Trump made things worse or better? And second of all, do we need more or less legal immigration? Bill? So I think the president has it upside down and backwards as usual. Uh, the truth is that we need more work visas in the United States, not fewer. I spent a lot of time in the western half of the country in the last uh, presidential cycle, and I can tell you any governor from Texas West will tell you that we cannot populate the agricultural and the construction industries during this season, the four-month season, without labor coming across, yes, the southern border. And yes, those people are from Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador as well as from Mexico. But if it weren't for that, the work doesn't get done. We should have a program like Canada's guest worker program that allows people to come in for four months and then go back to their families. Uh, just in, in general, I think the president has tried to demonize the whole immigration issue by persuading people that those people crawling across the southern border, those brown people crawling through the mud, they want to take away your job, so you should be resentful. They want to harass your wife, so you should be fearful. And it's just uh, the president's uh, constant strategy of trying to uh, set everybody's teeth on edge and divide the country one part uh, against another as part of an overall strategy. In terms of content, again, he has a one-word uh, one platform, wall. So uh, I, I, and he tries to uh, uh, suggest that everyone should be terrified because 11 million undocumented illegal aliens, in his word, all want to be citizens and they didn't stand in line. The great majority of those people have no interest in being citizens. They just overstayed their visa. That's why they're undocumented. But the president, as usual, is going off on a campaign to sow either fear or anger in his own country. Mark? Uh, um, I, I agree. He's inflamed the situation. Um, and we actually have a working example in this country. If you look at the Becerra program uh, from the 60s to early 80s, you know, that's a guest worker program, and it worked. Uh, I think we need to use models like that. This issue of immigration, Jennifer, more than any other issue, got Trump elected. He demagogued it. He talked about the wall, and Mexico is going to pay for it, and it's worse now because of him. Yes, uh, immigration is great for America. We need to expand legal immigration and make it easier to come here. But this issue of people coming into the country illegally, it's a real issue, and it's an issue the American people care about. Now, Trump's taken that issue, Jennifer. If you want to come to America, Republicans, we welcome everybody, no matter what your color or creed is. Trump has taken that, and he's turned it into brown-skinned people go back, which is absolutely bigoted and horrible. All right. We're going to do a couple lightning questions here. And I do mean lightning, so you get like a sentence or two, and that's all. Um, Bill, you're president of the United States. Who do you like for your secretary of state? Who are the people out there who you think are statesmen who you would want to send around the world representing the United States? I think Richard Haas at the Council on Foreign Relations could do the job. Uh, I think uh, any one of a number of uh, senior senators I can think of would do the job. Colin Powell, of course, is a wonderful model. James Baker is a wonderful model. George Shultz is a wonderful model. Uh, there are uh, ample very qualified candidates to choose from. Mark, for either Secretary of State or uh, Secretary of Defense, who do you like in that national security position who's going to have to really rebuild America's image in the world? I throw somebody back on the table like Admiral Mike Mullen, again, because of the way in which he's focused on the larger umbrella of, of, of threats, including, again, the national defense picture, which is, again, tied to the national debt picture, which I think is out of control. The nice thing, Jennifer, is there's a deep bench because none of these people wanted to work for Trump. <laughs> so, so yeah, people like even Colin Powell, as, as Bill said, there are some senators who would be wonderful. Uh, I, I'd love to bring General Mattis back in some important capacity. All right. Um, Bill, uh, you're, everyone likes to say in their first day in office. So give me two or three things you do in your first day in office. Well, I, I, I do the, the uh, showing I had the political will to staunch the uh, flow of red ink. Uh, I would rejoin the Paris Accord. I would rejoin the JCPOA with Iran that uh, Trump uh, tore up. I would uh, join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It would be a pretty, pretty full first day. Okay, and you, Mark? 
wouldn't agree with, uh, disagree with much of what Bill said, but I would say the absolute, again, epicenter of where I would focus would be on the, 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 our financial plight. We're walking toward the most predictable financial crisis in the history of man. We're living in the 1920s all over again, and we don't know it as we know what followed the 1920s was the Great Depression. Yep. Uh, and, and to piggyback on that, the reason we are at this precipice financially is because we have a health care issue in this country. The American people are living longer and longer and longer. How the heck are we going to pay for that? That would be the first bipartisan group of experts I would put together to begin immediately working on that problem. Bill, on guns. There is a Second Amendment, but we've had an epidemic of mass shootings, and it seems that the American people are pretty fed up. What do you do? I think the way out of the woods probably is the red flag laws to give either a co-worker or a family member the right to petition a judge, and you do need to have a judge to protect the rights of the accused, so to speak, uh, to have guns taken away from a person who has shown a violent predisposition or a history of uh, violence. One of the two uh, Texas shooters recently in the mass murders uh, carried around a list in high school of all the people he'd like to kill. Uh, two of our uh, prior mass shootings, prior to President Trump, uh, the people were under investigation by the FBI, but they couldn't, they couldn't finish the investigation in time. So it was well known to the FBI that this was an uh, Islamic Jihad sympathizer and a possessor of uh, weapons and a person who talked trash. Uh, at work, that person should not have been allowed to have uh, have guns. So I think the red flag laws and, and going to a judge and the judge can order it taken away uh, is is the best thing. You know, many people don't know this, but but um, I believe two thirds of all gun deaths in the United States every year are from suicides. And uh, you know that would be an example of something that could be reached by a family member under the red flag law. This person should not have a gun, and that could save many many lives. Mark. Um, I agree on the red flag laws. I think there are a couple of little marginal tweaks that one could start with. I, I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment. I, I don't think that there should be radical change there. But for instance, we had an atrocity in Charleston, South Carolina, wherein a person was kicked out of the system based on the three-day limit with what's called the Charleston loophole now. And I think extending that, uh, again, a couple of days is not a, a breach of the Second Amendment. Those kinds of marginal things, I think, could make a difference as well. The Second Amendment is every bit as important as every other amendment we have. 99.99% .99 of all gun owners in this country are legal law-abiding gun owners. But if I go across the street and go to a gun dealership and buy a gun, I have to undergo a federal background check. I should have to do and undergo that same background check if I buy a gun online or at a gun show. Bill, there's a lot of talk about all kinds of structural changes, repairing things. Uh, you were around during the Watergate era, and uh, there were a lot of post-Watergate uh, reforms, uh, keeping the president out of the IRS, for example. What are a couple of things you think we're going to need to do post-Trump to reinforce these institutions? Well, I think you have to uh, enforce the laws that we have. Uh, I've been very wary about the changes of the Justice Department, uh, seemingly instituted by Attorney General Barr up to and including the announcement a couple of days ago that he's going to open a criminal investigation into why the FBI opened an investigation on President Trump uh, and Russia. That, that, he calls it spying. That's not spying. I was the head of the criminal division of the Justice Department under Reagan. That's called opening an investigation. So what you have to do on the rule of law front is make sure the Justice Department does not get politicized. And I gave seven years of my life to that, and it's why I resigned from the Justice Department in 1988, because I think I thought that politics was getting into the system, and I wasn't willing to sit there and bear silent witness that that was okay. Mark? Uh, for me, I, I would look at things like the Emoluments Clause. I, I think we really need to tighten up on that front. I mean, it's bizarre that you can have an administration say with a straight face that, we went through some kind of selection process and came up with Doral for the G7. When you're like, what? That doesn't even, I mean, that flies in this, the face of common sense. This is not believable. And the same with the Trump Hotel. It is a well known fact in Washington, D.C. 
then a whole, and it was even on the recording in the Ukraine, people just happened to mention that, you know, I'm staying at your hotel, it's so lovely. Uh, that is a breach of the emoluments clause. I think we need to tighten language there in terms of a post-Trump reform. Hey, hey, Jennifer, the problem is Congress. Come on now, our founding fathers intended for Congress to be the branch of government. A lot of our founders didn't even want the office of the presidency. The reason Trump can be a dictator is because these Republicans and Democrats in Congress are not doing their job and they're allowing him to be a dictator. One of the first things I do as president is to call Congress into the White House and, and spend four years strengthening that branch of government and weakening the presidency. I'm gonna do now a couple rounds of yes or no's. Bill, in your administration, does the Justice Department prosecute President Trump? Yes. Mark? Yes. Joe? Heck yes. That was easy. Bill, in the will of administration, are there any constitutional amendments you wanna pass? Yes, I'd like to pass the 28th Amendment to undo uh, the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United that campaign for this No, probably not. Okay. Um, next one's a really easy one. If people are interested in your campaigns, what should they do? You want to give them your website and tell them where you're going to be in the next few days? So the website is well2020.org. It has any number of huge donate buttons. Uh, that's how to express love. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think we're all gonna be in Detroit for another get together in a couple of days. Between now and then, I'm at a democracy town hall in Nashua, New Hampshire. And uh, you know, another day, another state. Mark? Uh, for me, it's marksanford.com. We would welcome any and all help. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm actually flying back to Charleston this evening. I'm going to change clothes because I've been on the road for the last two weeks and, uh, and then meet these guys in Detroit on Monday. Joe? Uh, Jennifer, thank you. JoeWalsh.org. Be brave. Go there. Trump is a threat to this country. Stand up and act publicly on what you believe in privately. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. And with that, I think we should thank our guests for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.